question. Uh, yeah, this is my incredibly long title, which is quite a mouthful, but it will all become clear soon. Uh, I, I am at the, the University of Cambridge, although I'm in the material science group uh, in a group called DMG for device materials, which is what this uh, little widget at the side is. Uh, if you need to find me, I'll be on, on their website. Uh, so a quick overview of the talk so you don't get lost. I'll do a, a quick introduction to sort of uh, how my work fits into superconductivity. And then I'll quickly talk about these liquid-based growth methods. And then these are the two I actually uh, did all my, my work on. So this work was uh, what I did during my PhD. Uh, and then I'll quickly summarize at the end. So my work is based on these coated conductors. Uh, hopefully you've all heard of these, where you've got your uh, YIPCO film and you put it on a, a substrate uh, here, a sort of metal base layer, and you can go a sort of uh, kilometer length of this stuff, and then you can wrap it round and round and make big magnets for all of these wonderful applications. I don't actually make these applications. I'm more focused on actually how we grow the film. Uh, so I do grow things on this tape. I grow it on, on SDO and things like that. So that's where, where my work fits in. Uh, so the, the sort of currently there's quite a lot of ways of growing that superconducting layer on your coded conductors. There's sort of chemical methods and sort of the physical data definition methods, and there are lots of companies that grow them. I was mostly looking at a sort of TLD based approach, uh, mostly because that's the equipment I have in my lab. But this is somewhat relevant. There are a lot of companies that do directly use TLD to grow their, their kilometers of cable. Um, so what the, the current problem is, is the, these cables are still reasonably expensive, or at least it would be, be nicer if they were cheaper. And one of the reasons they're expensive is they can be quite slow to make. So your sort of standard PBD, where you're just doing a, a TLD or a stuff ring or something like that, you would deposit your flux on your substrate and you've got to leave it for enough time for these ad atoms to get to the right place and you make the right, right crystal structure. And this can be relatively slow. However, if you use a liquid-based approach, where you have a sort of liquid near your substrate and all of your diffusion happens in your liquid, you could rapidly increase the speed at which your, your film can form. And this is because your diffusion rates in the liquid are, tend to be a lot higher than the diffusion rates that sort of are on the surface. And if we could get a method that could sort of grow, grow our YIPCO films in a sort of liquid-based approach, then hopefully we could get something that's cheap. Uh, but obviously these films also have to be of a good quality. Otherwise, you're, you're, there's no point in growing film at all. Um, so that's what my work is basically on, whether I can grow a, a sort of Yipco film or, or a, a similar similar structure, so possibly gadolinium, that sort of thing, uh, quite fast using a liquid method and uh, making a good, good film. And obviously, if they're both fast and good, they're going to be cheap because you don't need as much material if it's good and you can make it faster so price people fall and things like that. So the sort of the idea of using liquids to grow films uh, wasn't my idea. The, the sort of first major use of using liquids to grow films, uh, which is a thing called liquid phase epitaxy, was started in the 60s in the semiconducting industry. And here what you had is basically your substrate, your silicon wafer, something like that, and you pass it by a sort of liquid containing the, the thing you want to dope it with, and then you just sort of slide it by, or you could try dipping it in. And then again, because your, your diffusion rates are much faster in your liquids, they tend to grow films a lot faster than when they just sputtered them on. Um, now, the, the first use of trying to use this sort of liquid-based approach to grow YIPCO films was sort of in the early 2000s. And here they literally just had sort of a barium copper rich liquid and then some salt of yttrium. And they would take some substrate here and here and just sort of dip it in and pull it out and, and try and grow a film like that. And although they did get some, some good films, it tends to be a bit unreliable. And it was mostly because you've got quite a lot of reactions between my, my substrate and my liquid. And my sort of liquid uh, YIPCO films uh, would sort of sometimes fall off and come unstuck back into the liquid. Uh, so this method sort of petered out, research units were sort of stopped. Uh, and then a new method called hybrid liquid phase epitaxy was invented. And in this one, instead of dipping your film in a liquid, what you do is you first deposit a layer. Uh, it's meant to be, uh, this, this thing here is meant to be my bearing copper oxide layer. And you do this at a low temperature, and then you would heat it up to form a liquid. So instead of dipping my film in a liquid, I'm depositing my liquid. And then once I've got my liquid on the substrate, I then deposit my, my YIPCO materials, my, my barium copper yttrium flux. And this will make my, my YIPCO layer because this will, all the diffusion will happen in the liquid and I'll quite rapidly form on my layer. 
But what they found again is that it was a bit unreliable. Sometimes you got phases that you didn't want storm uh, occurring, and you also got a lot of excess reactions between between my liquid and the substrate. And this was because you you sort of during this bit where you're heating it up, you are leaving it at, at a high temperature for quite a while, and you've got to leave it at a high temperature with liquid by the substrate while it's hosting, and you, you generally got reactions that you didn't want. So the question we uh, or what we were thinking, uh, the people in my group, mostly my supervisor, I must say. Uh, is can you can you try and sort of minimize the amount of time you're going to have a liquid by the substrate by depositing both my liquid and my my film material at the same time? And this is what we call liquid assisted processing or LAP uh, for short. A nice nice funny acronym. Uh, there's two methods of doing this. There's sort of an in situ method and an ex situ method, and I tried both of them. Uh, and it really the the in situ and ex situ is whether I actually grow my film while I'm depositing it, in which case it's in situ whether I deposit my film and then in a separate step uh, get the sort of liquid and film for me, and that's called ex situ. And the first one I'm going to show you is the ex situ method. Um, that's because this ex situ method is already actually used by a company called Sunam in Korea. And the way this method works is quite like the, the hybrid liquid phase that factory. You deposit a, an amorphous layer, but here instead of just depositing your sort of barium copper layer, you're going to deposit your, your sort of barium copper layer that will eventually become a liquid. And your sort of YIPCO material or your gadolinium 123 material. Uh, and you do this at a very low temperature and a very low oxygen pressure so that it stays amorphous. You then heat it up, still at a low pressure, and this helps my liquid form. So you go up to a couple of hundred, uh, not a couple of hundred, uh, about 800 degrees, between 800 and 900 degrees, and you get this liquid phase forming. And then you increase the PO2. And once you increase the PO2, the liquid becomes unstable, and my gadolinium 123 phase becomes stable. And the, the sort of gadolinium 23 film, the one you actually want to form, starts to crash out of the liquid, forming at first on the substrate because it's a, a low, low energy nucleation site. And this, this reaction happens incredibly quickly. As soon as you let the PO2 thing, this, this transformation goes incredibly fast, again, because you've got this uh, fast, fast fusion in the liquid. So the liquid is never around for long, it's only around for, for tens of seconds at the most, which really sort of minimizes the amount of time the liquid will find the substrate, causing these, these excess reactions. And the, the way Sunan do it, the, the way they do it in their big factory in Korea, is they use metallic targets that were hit by an electron beam gun. And this would deposit it with, with the correct ratio. So they use a slightly non stoichiometric ratio, obviously, to get this sort of liquid layer instead of just having my 1, 2, 3 phase forming. Uh, and then they would have these sort of rollers that would take the tape into a big oven that had a, a low oxygen zone and a high oxygen zone. But what, what the, so I was working with Sunan when I was doing this project, and what we, we were wondering wondering was whether we could repeat this process using sort of standard lab equipment, so just sort of using PLD in a PLD chamber. So instead of using E-beam and metallic targets, which need an awful lot of uh, checks and controls to make sure you deposit the, the ratio you want, I could just use PLD, where the sort of ratio that gets deposited is basically the ratio of the, of the target I'm putting down. Uh, so this was my task, just sort of trying to replicate this process that we know works using sort of PLD equipment. And then once I've got it to work, can I sort of improve the, the JC, uh, as the title of the talk says? So the, the first thing to do is, can you grow an amorphous film using PLD? So it's sort of this, this part of the, the process. And obviously that is actually quite easy. You just sort of deposit something at a very low temperature at a very fast rate, and you end up with a nice amorphous film with no sort of big crystalline peak. Uh, this was a film CNN sent me from the factory. So this is a, a film, an amorphous film posted by electron beam deposition. And this is one deposited by, by PLD from a PLD target, and they look uh, reasonably, reasonably similar. Now you've just got a big amorphous pump, and this is a substrate peak. So, yes, you can make an amorphous film. Uh, then you come to the next part can you process the film in this way? So, can you heat this amorphous film, get this liquid layer forming, and then get a final layer forming if I just heat up my, my amorphous film and then let in the PO2? And to, to cut a long story short, the answer is yes. So again, this is sort of an XRD trait of, of a film that I deposited using PLD, and this is one from the factory deposited using e -beam. So This is one after all the processes set, and you've got these nice big uh, gadolinium multi three phase peaks, and you had a, a nice high PC and a nice high JC. So the answer is yes, you, you can now use this method, uh, or it's possible to use this method with uh, the standard PLD equipment, although there are a few caveats to that, in case you wanted to try and repeat this process. Uh, the first caveat is that uh, you need to deoxygenate your, your target, you need to deoxygenate your amorphous film. 
So when you're doing standard TLD or, or standard sort of uh, any sort of TBD, you usually get a target that you'll mix together and then eat either in air or in oxygen to sort of make your oxide target. But what we found is if we deposited from my oxide target, you'd end up with sort of unwanted, probably oxide phases in my, my end film. And these phases weren't too conducting, they seemed to block the current. I didn't get very uh, high TCs or JCs from these sorts of films. What I wanted to form was basically just my uh, gadolinium oxide phases and my, my main gadolinium 123 phase. And when we looked at the amorphous films, what we found is that, as you'd expect, if you were depositing from an oxide target, you had a lot more copper oxygen bonds. Basically, there's a lot more oxygen in the amorphous film. And this is probably why these films are forming instead of the, the ones we wanted, because once you've got lots of oxygen around and you start heating it up, things start to crystallize before my sort of liquid can form. And then if my liquid doesn't form properly, I'm not going to get the reaction before my uh, nutrient-123 uh, nutrient gadolinium-123 phase. Uh, but the, the way to get around that was simple. You just have to anneal your targets in argon instead of oxygen. Uh, and once we, once we started doing this, we didn't get these, these unwanted oxide peaks anymore. We just got peaks like the, the ones in the factory. And we got rid of these sort of uh, oxygen copper uh, peaks in our XBS traces. Basically, we, we've removed lots of, lots of oxygen from our deposit film because we removed it from the target. Uh, the second caveat is that we found that you did get a lot of evaporation. So when we're heating our films in vacuum, so the first part of the processing is obviously you uh, heat up the film, uh, but you do this at a very low oxygen pressure, so you don't get uh, these unwanted oxide phases forming. But the problem when you heat things in vacuum is they tend to evaporate. And this is a rather extreme case. But what you can see is that you, you, you have a lot less barium than you started with. And there's basically hardly any barium here at all. There was also uh, quite a lot of copper loss, although it isn't as obvious in this picture. Uh, and the reason you get a relative amount of barium and copper loss is that they just have a lower vaporization energy. So if you heat things up, all three of them are going to evaporate, but these two are going to evaporate faster. But again, it was quite easy to, to account for this by just remaking a target, but with a higher barium and copper amount, so that it will sort of compensate for the, the barium and copper that gets lost as you heat it up. So once you, you account for those two little caveats, you, you can successfully do this with exit to liquid assisted processing methods using sort of TBD, TLD equipment, uh, as well as just your sort of EV equipment. So getting on to the actual improving IC part, as, as said in the title of the talk, the problem with these exit to films is you do end up with very large secondary phase particles. So because you're not using a stoichiometric composition, you are always going to end up with some, some non-123 uh, phase forming. Uh, and here, what you, you ended up with was quite a lot of these gadolinium oxide phases. And um, because, again, you've got liquid around and you've got fast diffusion, these, these gadolinium oxide phases can uh, grow quite brisk, peak while you're heating it up. So you get a lot of coarsening when you've got a lot of uh, fast diffusion going on. And these, these big particles are pretty bad at pinning and they just tend to block the current. And generally, it would be, it'd be beneficial if we could minimize the size of them because then they would just act as pinning centers and hopefully improve the, the critical current. So when you go through the research, you find this isn't a new problem. Making things smaller is sort of a general theme of material science. And again, when people were making sort of bulk films, bulk films, bulk uh, uh, sort of pellets of Yipco, uh, especially from melts, they found that they also had secondary phase particles that were quite big and uh, counterproductive. And they got around it by just sort of doping their, their, their liquid and their, their pellets with bees, so with platinum or with uh, cerium. And what these tended to do was uh, create sort of more nucleation sites. So you had much more nucleation going on. Instead of only a few big particles forming, you had lots of little particles forming. And then they also lowered the surface tension between my liquid and my, my particles. And obviously, if you have a, a lower surface tension, you're going to have a, a smaller driving force to cause them. And that means my, my particles stay small once they've, once they've nucleated. At least that's the, the theory behind it. Uh, but despite working in the bulk, uh, when I tried it in film using the, the method I just showed, it, it didn't seem to work. So the particles just either remained big uh, or got slightly bigger in some cases, or some other phases formed that ended up blocking the current instead of my, my gadolinium oxide. So this, this topic needs a bit more research, but because I've now got this sort of uh, process down with standard TLD equipment, hopefully we can, we can progress with that quite, quite easily. However, 
instead of using sort of an exit to that method where I sort of do a two stage thing, so where I deposit my, my uh, layer, form my liquid, and then form my film, it might be even more beneficial if I could sort of merge all these steps together and instead form my, my YIPCO and my liquid at the same time. So that would look something like this. So I would have my substrate, I would then immediately deposit, and then uh, my, my liquid and my RIPCO would be stable at the same point. And so my, as long as I keep depositing, I'll keep getting both of them and I'll still have the fast diffusion. And therefore I can get a, a quite a big film at a quite fast rate. And for this to work, I need both of these two to be here at the same time. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So, so the idea here is literally just using standard PLD equipment. So again, I'm just going to deposit something from my target and then uh, my film, which would be at these conditions, so called standard PLD conditions, uh, will have this going on. So I'll have my liquid and my ribco there at the same time. And to do this, I just need to make sure I've got the correct composition so that both of these liquid and ribco phases are stable under these conditions. And the way to do that is just to look at a phase diagram, or at least ideally the, idea, the best thing to do would just be look at a phase diagram. So if you, if you find a phase diagram, around the right conditions, so sort of a slightly low PO2 and high temperature, you, you find the part of the phase diagram that has both phase you want to form, so the liquid and the, the YIPCO, uh, where they're in sort of a, a equilibrium. And then as long as I pick the composition here and have these conditions, I should, I should have both of them forming. However, there are a couple of things that are, are wrong with this. Uh, one of them is that this is only an approximate phase diagram. So, it's quite hard to, to sort of look at phases, especially under these sort of more extreme conditions. Uh, it's also you need an awful lot of data points to get one of these accurately. So you can't quite just say, if I have this composition, this can definitely form. You've got to include the error in, in sort of making these phase diagrams. And then because these phase diagrams are also built uh, just looking at sort of bulk phases and what happens with the uh, equilibrium, uh, that won't quite be the same thing as what happens when you're growing thin films. So when you're growing thin films, sort of kinetic factors are a lot more of a astringent problem because I'm growing things so fast and I'm not giving them time to equilibrate, I'm just growing the film and then the next layer will start growing. Uh, so kinetic factors could throw all this off. And then also once you've got sort of substrates involved, your sort of delta G formations are also going to change. So if I've got some phase going to be very stable growing on the substrate, that may start forming even though my phase diagram doesn't predict it will form. Uh, so the only real solution to this problem is just to test lots of compositions to see which ones work i.e. just pick a lot of them round here, so round where the phase diagram sense should work, and slightly slightly further away, and then see if any of those actually form this, um, this sort of uh, get up when I'm, I'm depositing. So this is what we're aiming for. This is a stoichiometric film grow at a, a low rate, so this is what's the benchmark. It's a slightly higher temperature, so it's not quite optimized, but generally what we want is nice sharp peaks. We want a high GC and a reasonably high JC, so something over a mega amp would be quite good. What we don't want is what happens when you try and grow stoichiometric films at a fast rate. Uh, and that is you get quite broad peaks, you get a very uh, broad transition, you get a very low TC, and therefore you get a very low JC. Mm -hmm. So what happens when I basically deposited these compositions using PLD? Uh, under these conditions? Well, most of them, as you might have expected, didn't work. Uh, you either got lots of phases that you didn't want forming, you either got very low TCs, uh, or you've got very sort of pitted and cracked surfaces. So this sort of happens when you sort of use liquid-based processing, because once you start cooling down your film, the liquid starts to contract, and it can sort of uh, uh, produce cracks in your film, which obviously stops current flowing and things like that. But fortunately, we did find one composition that works pretty well. Uh, this has this iron ratio, so not stoichiometric. Uh, we found the sort of optimal growth conditions for, for sort of PLD. And um, we grew it again at 50 hertz, which is sort of the maximum rate my laser can go at. Uh, and what we found is that I did get sharp peaks, so much sharper than the stoichiometric film grown at the same, same growth rate. I did get a high TC, I did get a high JC. Uh, and therefore I sort of succeeded in growing my, my in situ lap films. Um, I should also say, if this will come up later, because it's not stoichiometric, you do end up with other phases that you didn't get in your, your stoichiometric uh, films. And this includes my yttrium oxide particles. 
but this isn't necessarily a bad thing, as we will get to. So now I've got my, my sort of in situ lap method. So I'm just depositing my films, and there is a sort of liquid helping it form at a fast rate. Can I improve the, the JC and IC even more? And the way to do that, as you all probably know, is to start adding pinning sensors. So add things that will stop my vortices moving. And there are sort of uh, many examples in the literature of pinning sensors you can add to Yipco films. Uh, but we needed to find one that will also form a fast rate. So I'm forming this, this uh, YIPCO at uh, a very fast rate. I need my APC to form a very fast rate, otherwise I'm going to end up with uh, problems. And of the, the APCs I looked at, this one here for Bina, this composition seems the best match. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, it has a very close match to the YIPCO lattice, which means there isn't going to be much of a nucleation barrier to, to stop it forming. So hopefully it can form at fast rates. And the second thing is that the, the rate limiting element for this guy's formation is going to be the, the neo, neobium, because the barium and the yttrium and things are going to be in abundance in the sort of yip code phase as well. And the niobium has a very, very fast diffusion rate. Uh, so all these things together mean that this thing should, should be the sort of APC that's most likely to be able to form at fast rates as I want in my, my institute that films. So basically I did the same thing as I did before, but now I added Bina. So it's just, it looks like basic CLD, but I've got the, the new adjusted in situ lap composition, but now I've added Bino to it. And the, the films the films were pretty good. So again, I still have my nice, nice uh, sharp peaks. The films were still textured, by actually textured. I still had high TCs, I still had high JCs, and my Bino did indeed form. So these are uh, these PEM diagrams that aren't brilliant uh, contrast, but this is the sort of Yipco, and this is sort of my Bino, and you can also see the Bino peak in my uh, XRD. So I can say I can successfully add APCs to my in situ lap method. And then if you look at sort of, uh, does it improve JC? The answer is yes. So comparing, so first of all, my, my sort of liquid process films, my stoichiometric films, when you grow them at fast rates, the liquid process films are a lot better. So you need the order of magnitude better, especially at sort of higher temperatures. Uh, and once you start adding APCs, which can form in my intensity lab films, you can improve the JC even further. So then you can ask, can I improve the JC even more than that? And the way you would do that is sort of adding isotropic thinning. So these bino just form as 1D columns. To sort of increase the JC even further, you're going to want to add sort of thinning away from this sort of a uh, columnar structure. So if you did look at sort of an angular plot of JC, uh, this is parallel. If you this is your magnetic field. Uh, the angle your magnetic field makes with your film. So here your magnetic field is parallel to the C-axis, i.e. parallel to these, these bino columns, the APC columns, and then the 90 degrees would be perpendicular to that. And sort of in an extreme case, you'll have really good pinning, so really good JC parallel to the columns. But away from that, you're going to massively drop off your JC. And if you want to use your sort of YIPCO films, the YIPCO cables in sort of a, a, a solenoid or things like that, you are going to get in some parts Places where your magnetic field isn't going to cut your wire uh, sort of in the place where you want it to, it's going to cut it in a slightly different position. And that means the current I can actually put through my, my whole tape is going to be limited to the, the sort of minimum amount on this curve, or at least the minimum amount where my, my field is going to cut my wire. So what would be better than this is something that looks like this. So even though it might be lower than at the peak, if it was at least higher at the, the sort of minimum or maximum angle my, my field's going to cut, my tape, I'm going to be able to put a larger current through it. And the way to get a more sort of flat uh, JC curve with angle is to start adding 3D and 0D defects, i.e. isotropic defects. Uh, you also get a benefit if you start adding these 3D and 0D defects to this peak as well. So although I've said that the main reason we're doing this is to make it flat, we should also see an enhancement parallel to C. And that's because you sort of introduce this um, way of blocking a sort of low energy pathway for vortex movement when you've got lots of uh, 1D columns. So when people think about adding 1D APCs to their uh, film, they think that basically I'm going to trap my vortex on my uh, APC, and then we'll need to apply a very large Lorentz force to pull my vortex off it before it can move to the next one. But what happens in real films is that instead of de-pinning the whole vortex at once, I just de-pin a small amount of it, which means a, a lot smaller sort of Lorentz force. Uh, and then this sort of bubble will grow until it hits the next APC. And then the whole vortex can move across by just sort of moving these, these arms of it. 
And obviously just moving a little bit of the arm at a time it needs a lot less force, a lot less uh, energy than detailing the whole thing. But if you start adding zero D defects to it, you can sort of pin these arms, and stop them moving, and therefore sort of track my, my vortex basically on, on the on the ATC it starts with. And in this way, you should also improve your, your JC parallel to see. Uh, so what do I mean by these isotropic pinning sensors? Uh, well, basically it's just anything that doesn't look sort of polymer or 2D. Uh, so on a sort of big scale, so something that's quite big with respect to the, the size of my vortices or the size of my coherence length, I will call 3D particles. And I said earlier, I've got sort of yttrium oxide forming. And so yttrium oxide would be a perfect example of the sort of 3D defects. And so by growing in situ lab films, I'm already including the, the sort of beneficial defects in the film. Uh, but I could probably improve it further if I started adding smaller defects. So anything that's sort of around the same size as my coherence length. And because the coherence length in Yuko is so small, these are basically just zero dimensional defects. So things like substitutional lab. So these defects are especially good at low temperatures. So if we're talking about using our coded conductors and stuff at sort of very high magnetic fields, I'm going to want to use it at a very low temperature because then I can go to a much larger, larger field than if I was at a high temperature. And once you start going down to lower temperatures, uh, studies have shown that basically these zero D defects start to be the dominant pinning force rather than the sort of columns and 3D defects that are already present in the film. So finding a way to add these would really sort of, or it should really help the, the sort of JC at low temperatures and therefore really help uh, sort of my, my coded conductors in these high magnetic fields. Uh, and the way you can do that is sort of doping your films with other rare earths that are slightly the wrong size of the matrix. So I usually have a, a yttrium based film, but if I add either a rare earth that's slightly too big, so like uh, terbium, or slightly too small, like samarium, then I'm going to get this oops, wrong way around, samarium's bigger and terbium's smaller, and we get these sort of distortions in the lattice. And these can act as a small zero D pinning sites. And because they're just rare earth, and they'll just substitute in, it should hopefully be isotropic and not just spread around everywhere in the lattice. So basically, I did the same thing as I did before, but now I'm substituting in uh, some, some samarium and ytterbium, that's not going to be an M there, for my yttrium. And uh, I first of all showed that you can do this uh, using the in situ lap method. So when you start stubbing in these, these other rare earths, your film form fine, you still get high PCs, slightly degraded, but still okay. And you don't get weird unwanted phases or, or sort of a phase splitting going on. And uh, as uh, predicted by the sort of models, uh, low temperatures, the, the sort of JC would be slightly improved, although uh, at high temperatures it's not so much. Uh, and this is mostly because you're, you're adding too much disruption and these pinning sites aren't, aren't that useful at high temperatures. So now that I've shown that these things can be added to in situ lap, what happens if I combine everything together? So to also try and get this mechanism. So basically I took my, my composition I found to work and then threw in the bino and then also substituted in some samarium and uh, euterbium. And I found that even that was fine. So even though I've added all of these defects in it, I could still make pretty good films, pretty sharp peaks. I still get my bino forming, even though I've got these other phases, uh, other phases, other elements around. And the TCs are not that degraded, but I still get pretty good JCs, even at 77 Kelvin. And then, especially down towards lower temperatures, I can get a, a, a very sort of a high JC, uh, although it's not as good at a high temperatures, mostly because you've got a bit too much disruption. Uh, and then the, the last part is obviously what does the angular data look like, considering it was the, the sort of angular response I wanted to improve. Well, especially at low temperatures where these zero D defects are more beneficial, you do see the peaks start to broaden. So you see your, your JC response start to get more, more isotropic. Um, and so we've basically shown that you can grow films really fast with flat, and you can, you can add lots of pinning centers to improve their performance. So that's why I summarized here for all of it. Um, you, can, you can do your liquid assisted processing with sort of a standard PVD equipment, the standard TLD equipment, you're just changing the composition basically. You can grow high crystallized films at very fast rates. These films form at least as good as stoichiometric films grown 10 times slower. And you can even add pinning sensors even at these very fast rates to improve the end. Thank you very much, John.
for a really clear talk. You got through an awful lot in, in a short space of time. Yeah, I was 